Question of the day. Can the quality of a piece of art be objectively judged? A little over a year ago, I threw myself into this debate headfirst when I made a guest appearance on Jack Saint's video about YouTube's most verbose critic, Mahler. Since that video came out, I have been compulsively arguing with whoever I can about this subject on Twitter, and I think it's high time I made a comprehensive update. You know, as a sort of farewell gift to the debate that took a year off my life. I was a different gender when this shit started. Now, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure Mahler won't be watching this. I've been a low-priority target for a while now. They see me as just vindictive and attention-seeking at this point, and I'm just not worth the effort. As I'm writing this, my video on rags has been placed on their back burner, although I'm pretty sure they've stated that if there isn't anything better to watch, they'll give it a shot. So they might have done it by the time this is recorded and released, but I'm not checking. I'm sure their fans won't wait to let me know if it ever happens. Helpful bunch. I, for one, am happy to play along and allow us to fall into a state of mutually ignoring each other forever after I'm done with this. Because, as I said, I spent an entire year trying my best to understand all sides of the debate over whether artistic quality could be measured objectively, and the answer is a bit more complicated than I originally thought. Now, the difficult part that I hadn't quite comprehended back in last January is that what it means to say that art can be objectively critiqued isn't quite set in stone. After all, when we say objective in normal conversation, we aren't always talking about immutable absolute truth. Naturally, this means that every time I argue about this, it seems the definition has changed. Maybe it's because my opponents have been moving the goalposts. Maybe it's because my opponents are all independently holding a variety of positions while somehow believing themselves to be completely in agreement. So, uh, I'm pretty sure the only course of action I can take is to just go through all of them. One last thing before we start. Uh, at no point in this video will I be arguing from the position that humans aren't truly capable of objectively observing the world in the first place. Like, uh, it's true, but I firmly believe that the discussion about art criticism specifically isn't about this, and philosophical discussions on the nature of perception generally serve to distract and obfuscate the actual point. For the purposes of my arguments, perception is reality. Okay? Okay. Part 1. Fundamentalist Mahlerism. First up is the position that artistic quality exists as a measurable trait within the art itself. Given enough evidence, one can conceivably arrive at an immutable solution as to the quality of whatever piece of art is being judged. This is probably what most people think when they first hear someone talk about objectively critiquing art, and I'm not entirely convinced that it isn't what Mahler still believes. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is the position that you need to hold in order to be able to judge a piece of art as being objectively bad, with no added caveats. Star Wars The Last Jedi is objectively bad content. It is provable. In order to make this claim, you must believe that the badness of a piece can be observed impartially, that there is some singular standard that won't change if someone else of equal reasoning ability is able to observe the exact same evidence. This is also the thought process that I believe led to Mahler hearing this. Let's say that you point out that this knife disappears mid-swipe. Where did it go? And you're right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. That knife is, is, it's gone. It was there and now it's gone. Well done. You're very observant. But if we were using the word correctly, um, the objective statement would be that the knife is missing. You haven't actually said whether the film is good or bad or well made or poorly made until you can say why this knife trick made the film worse, which is subjective. And, on his response stream, acting as if I was simply challenging him to give his reasoning. Like, that's all I was missing in this discussion. Lee, um, it's gonna the be a objective cliffhanger. statement would be that the knife is missing. What? You haven't actually said whether the film is good or bad or well made or poorly made until you can say why this knife trick made the film worse. So, oh. so uh, oh. the first problem here is that uh, I'm not sure that I've ever explained why the knife disappearing has uh, made the movie worse, but um, I never would have expected that I'd have to explain to somebody that a weapon disappearing into thin air makes the movie worse. Should we do it anyway? No. Clearly <laughs> some people need I it. 
I just really like the the condescending, good for you, Mahler. You fucking noticed that. Do you want a cookie? It's like, are, are you just okay with things vanishing? Is that not something I should take note of? Because there is only one lens to determine something to be an artistic flaw. If you disagree, it's either because you know there are flaws and just personally don't care, as subjective judgment, or it's because you haven't been presented with the right evidence. Mahler guessed I was in group two and gave me the evidence. Unless I'm prepared to argue that the knife didn't actually disappear, the conversation is over. Which is subjective. This conflation no. leads to Mahler... Nope. If you are Mahler or a fan of Mahler's and I got your views wrong yet again, I apologize. Please look for my addendum inside your ass. This argument falls flat almost immediately if you, uh, consume art, even staying within the same medium to keep things simple, film for example, the entire concept of genre will make it obvious that no objectively observable element of a film can be objectively good or bad in all cases. Now, I'm near certain that Mahler has stopped using this exact terminology since the release of that video, uh, preferring to call things objectively poorly written. This makes sense, because it seems completely absurd to me to imagine the existence of an objectively bad object. However, even within this framing, it is difficult for me still to imagine any objectively observable element of a piece to be deemed objectively in favor of the writing or otherwise in all cases. In the end, I don't see this as an especially great leap in logic. Okay, it is bold of me to posit that there are no standards that can be considered universal, what about a standard that is based exclusively on generalities? That seems to be how it usually goes. A flaw is simply an internal inconsistency of any kind, wherever it may arise. Superfluous elements, tonal clashing, these things are flaws regardless of whatever kind of film is being critiqued, and these are all things that Mahler will point out frequently. I don't think you need to understand much about the pattern here or why it's bad, since it is very obvious. Don't provide your audience with multiple conflicting emotions at the same time. It is distracting and it also cuts right through the immersion. And, uh, sorry, I can't ride with that either. You may not have noticed, but it tends to be the case that every time someone tries to set a rule, there immediately spews forth a billion pretentious blowhards that will stop at nothing to find the limits of that rule. Like, uh, don't make people feel more than one emotion at once? Emotional ambiguity, emotional contrast, these are things people have been exploring for a while. Have you seen The Lobster? I'd say it's a pretty accessible and clear example of this. Yorgos Lanthimos' style of comedy is to just not give any clear indication that you should be laughing and to simply trust you to figure it out. There's zero delineation between the comedy and the allegorical dystopian horror. They're both present in excess at all times. Maybe you're not into Lanthimos. That's fine. Maybe you are into Lanthimos and you have a reason that it actually supports your point. During all this, I found out Mahler is actually a fan of Under the Skin. Either way, though, the creation of a rule still creates an influx of artists looking to usurp it, and that then makes whatever rule is being usurped completely inadequate for the purpose of critique, which I'm assuming is the goal here. Like, if you just want to be incredibly shitty at art criticism, then I guess this argument doesn't really apply. Uh, do what you like, I'm not your mom. Part 2 the softening. Since it is obviously ridiculous to hold every piece of art to any one standard, a lot of people issue that position and instead posit that objective critique is simply the consistent application of any singular standard. If I'm remembering correctly, Mahler has said he subscribes to this. Possibly. I'm gonna try and find it in the editing stage. Well, we're talking about the term quality. That's an extremely, extremely nebulous term compared to various My other terms. My that... qualification of the word quality in this scenario would be the degree to which a standard was achieved. Now, on first blush, this might seem like an admission that objective art criticism isn't objective at all. But again, I should reiterate that objectivity isn't always used to refer to immutable truth in common conversation. With this in mind, let's imagine that objective critique is the practice of determining the degree to which a piece of art meets a standard. I just have one question. Uh, what standard? Are some standards more relevant or appropriate than others? I feel like I need to assume the answer is yes, because if all standards are equally valid, then we've just decided artistic quality is subjective after all. An object, whose value is wholly decided by whatever arbitrary standard you apply to it, cannot be said to have measurable objective value. And viewing art through this lens certainly wouldn't allow you to come to any conclusion as to a piece's objective quality. 
So let's go ahead with the idea that some standards for art criticism are better, or perhaps more objective than others. There's two ways to interpret this. To cover my bases, let's start by imagining there exists, somewhere, a theoretical best standard to judge art. Perhaps we haven't reached it, but given enough time, it can be reached. Now, the problem here is that we've circled back to the beginning. Instead of artistic quality being measurable in the art, the standards by which we view the art have inherent measurable quality. At the theoretical point where we've found the best standard, we're back at square one. Just rewatch the last section. Let's take a more charitable interpretation. Perhaps, instead of a single theoretical standard, every piece of art has its own standard that is most appropriate. An objectively bad piece of art is one that can be observed to have failed in meeting its own standards. This seems pretty airtight at first, since my initial problem was that it's impossible to find a standard that is appropriate in all cases. This worldview posits that we can simply meet every piece of art where it's at and objectively determine the degree to which it achieves perfection on its own merits. Except, uh, we still have the same problem. We don't know what standard to use. In fact, uh, the problem has been split into a billion tiny problems, one for each piece of art ever made. For any given piece, by what process are we to determine what merits we're talking about in the first place? Well, I've actually heard a couple different answers to this. The most frequent answer I've seen is some kind of metaphysical appeal to either genre conventions or theoretical truisms. In the video we did together, Jack Saint posits that perhaps not being able to see the Black Panther clearly during the first scene he appears in costume is an intentional decision, akin to leaving the xenomorph mostly hidden in Alien. Mula jabbing at Black Panther because it's too dark to see him well in the opening fight scene is ultimately meaningless because he doesn't argue why this is a problem for the film. In Alien, the Xenomorph is in darkness most of the film, yet you'd probably huff if you heard me blithely criticise the film because I couldn't see it most of the time. Because you understand it matches with the film's desire to create tension and a sense of the unknown. Black Panther, with the fact that it switches much of the perspective to the guards who are scared of him, also appears to be riding on this idea. And their response? Mauler jabbing at Black Panther because it's too dark to see him well in the opening fight scene is ultimately meaningless. He's because just saying he, he doesn't Mauler argue just saying he couldn't why. see. So, um, we could jump That's to another an video. Mistake. How he counters this argument is hilarious. Up Black Panther because it's too dark to see him well in the opening fight scene is ultimately meaningless because he doesn't argue why this is a problem for the film. In Alien, the oh. Xenomorph is in darkness most of okay. the film, yet you'd probably- So, um, <laughs> does anyone want to have a crack at this, this uh, counter? Well, well, you see, when it's too dark to tell what's happening, that's an editing mistake. That's a lighting mistake. If you can't tell what's happening, how are you supposed to be enjoying the scene? But this dark and alien. Yeah, to compare an action scene with a horror scene is incredibly ridiculous. Because an action scene, you inherently need to understand the progression of events. While a horror scene, and I talk about how flickering lights in Alien makes it harder for the viewer to discern exactly what the creature is. We can see it, but we're still like, what? what is that? What the hell is that? And that's by design, because they want you to remain as unaware of exactly what it is for as long as they can. It's a fucking horror, it's trying to create suspense. While in Black Panther, you need to argue from a position of action. If I can't fucking understand who is even hurting or what's happening, I'm just sitting there waiting for the scene to conclude, and they go, yeah, he won, by the way. I'll be like, thanks. Now, that seems pretty cut and dry. Action movies, unlike horror movies, have a precedent to put forth the on-screen events in a clear fashion that doesn't tire the eyes. So, what's the issue? Well, I just personally do not see the utility in viewing genres in this way. Genres are marketing terms and vague descriptors to ease artistic discussion between normal people. They aren't robust categories, and trying to analyze them as such reveals holes basically instantly. Like, uh, is Dune a science fiction novel? There's probably a flame war in this video's comment section now that I've raised that question. Is No Country for Old Men an action movie? Probably. That is until it starts killing off major characters off screen, making the plotline actively more difficult to follow. If you can't tell what's happening, how are you supposed to be enjoying the scene? According to Wolf, does that make it a worse action movie? I'd have to disagree strongly with that, but I'm just one girl. 
is Funny Games a horror movie? Like, it looks like one, it feels like one, but it kind of sucks if you analyze it as one. At their most concrete, genres are a cloud of various conventions and tropes shared across a large number of works. But not every action movie will contain all the trappings of action movies. The problem here is that any appeal to convention can only look backwards at that incomprehensible cloud. Genre conceits didn't sprout fully formed and ready to have movies made following them before there were any movies. I'd even go so far as to say this fact holds true for any artistic convention. People made movies, and we came up with words to describe what they made. Granted, we're not at ground zero anymore, we have genres, we have conventions, but we're not at the end, right? Like, there's still more stuff to figure out. Any critique that relies on treating the trappings of a genre, or even the baseline assumptions of a field of theory, as axiomatic will inherently be short-serving the piece at hand. For every piece of art that isn't a carbon copy of something else, there must be at least a nugget of something new in the analysis, or else by default we'd be stuck with the same terms and conditions we invented at the medium's inception. And as I have chosen to argue from a position of practicality, this isn't ideal. Alright, so instead of looking backwards, let's look at the piece of art at hand. Perhaps a piece of art can be objectively good if it achieves what it sets out to achieve. This is a particularly egalitarian way of looking at things, and I have to say I'm rather attracted to the idea. But I have one question. Is it even possible to discover what a piece of art is trying to achieve just by examining it? Can the intent of a work be observed in the work itself? Well, uh, no, it can't. Art is merely the result of intent. There isn't actually any intent inside the art, because art doesn't think. It's definitely possible to infer the intent by observing the art. In fact, I'd say that's the basis of most art criticism. Like, if you're going to criticize someone's art and you can't just ask them directly, you need to make a guess as to what they were trying to achieve. But whatever you come up with to judge the work by is a subjective interpretation, right? You're interpreting the intent of something. And again, I don't think we can call this an objective judgment under any commonly used definition of the word, as ultimately, the value is still decided entirely by the viewer. But uh, what if you could ask the author what they were trying to achieve? Would any judgments based on what we truly know to be the author's goals be an objective assessment? Perhaps, but if I may argue from a position of practicality again, we've just lost the ability to objectively analyze any piece of art made by an author that doesn't want to tell you what their artistic goals are. Under this framework, it is impossible to objectively criticize Synecdoche, New York. And even ignoring that, treating the author's word as gospel is a pretty obviously flimsy path to go down. And unless everyone started analyzing The Room as a dark comedy the second Tommy Wiseau said he'd intended it to be one all along, I think most people understand that. So, if I covered my bases adequately, that's all the arguments I've seen for this particular version of objective art criticism, the ones that involve individualized processes for determining the theoretical most objective standard for any given situation. But uh, surprisingly, we're not done. The goalposts can still be moved to what I believe is the final position, and it's weird. Part 3. Postmodern Objectivity As far as I can tell, the last position involves a gruesome stretching of Google's definition of objective. That being, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. When applied to art criticism, this apparently means that as long as you're exclusively basing your analysis on what's provable in the text without allowing for personal bias to motivate your reasoning, the judgment can be considered objective. Let's take a second to try and define what it even means to judge art without bias. This isn't a completely foreign concept. I've heard a lot of people make a distinction between the best and my favorite, so what's the difference between these two ideas? Think about the last time you thought something was good but didn't personally like it, or perhaps the other way around. What informed the conclusion of the thing's quality divorced from your personal enjoyment? Well, recognizing quality in something without personally enjoying it is actually a pretty simple phenomenon to explain. We, as art-consuming individuals, have absorbed a cultural language of practices and conventions. We just kind of learned what's good over time. But this is, at its essence, still an opinion. Perhaps the opinion of a simulated person who holds all the most common conventions in high regard, but it is still an opinion. There is nothing objectively determining this opinion to be closer to any sort of truth. 
Like, watch any of Mahler's critiques if you can stomach it, and listen for all the parts where he actually explains why the thing he's pointing out is an objective ill. Don't provide your audience with multiple conflicting emotions at the same time. It is distracting and it also cuts right through the immersion. It's always about the film being too jarring, breaking immersion, sacrificing emotional resonance. These are subjective judgments made by an imaginary audience that Mahler invented for rhetorical purposes, and that's fine. But, uh... I guess if you could consistently and impartially apply a standard to something without considering your own preferences, the resulting critique could be a kind of objective, like it's technically a judgment without personal bias. We're really stretching the definition now, though. And, like, haven't we just defined objective critique as critique that's based on any standard that isn't yours? At that point, why not just add your standard back on? Like, y you got all of them. This really just seems unnecessary to me. Like, maybe you can determine objectively that there's inconsistencies in The Last Jedi, but, uh, I can completely objectively and impartially determine that it has porgs, and as sanctioned by the porg paradigm, uh, The Last Jedi is the best film, it's perfect. If you disagree, I expect a formal presentation of your evidence that there are not, in fact, any porgs in The Last Jedi, which I believe is going to be quite difficult because, uh, okay, joke's over, uh, there's obviously some bias here. Yeah, it's arbitrary, but so is any standard. Again, art isn't really anything without someone interpreting it. One might even argue that's what makes it art, and not simply craft. What is the difference between the objective standard and the Porg paradigm? Mahler, perhaps, would say that his standard is based on decades of academic study surrounding the craft of storytelling and filmmaking. Debatable, but alright. Whereas my paradigm was invented by me alone, specifically as a thought experiment for this video you're watching now. However, something doesn't become more true as more people believe it, not inherently. Like, if you're determining which trebuchet slings cannonballs the farthest, you don't take a survey, you perform an experiment. What I'm saying is, exchanging your own bias for the bias of an imagined neutral third party isn't objectivity. Now, if you're one of those people who follows this up by saying that yes, there is no fundamental difference between having a bias towards a lack of plot holes and a bias towards porgs, I'd like to personally congratulate you for independently discovering the concept of subjectivity. But wait, aren't there a host of examples of things which are only true because a large portion of the population agrees it is true? Like, perhaps any potential academic standard for artistic quality would be arbitrary, but so is the inch, equus ferris, b-flat minor, 100 yen. Socially constructed facts aren't objective truth when we take it literally, but when we soften the definition to a more colloquial framework, it's not hard to picture being objective in reference to, say, a budget. Simply pointing out that the value of a dollar is arbitrary wouldn't be an adequate argument against that. Now, I'm pretty sure this is getting annoying at this point, but let's once again argue from a position of practicality. Like, there is a pretty well-set-in-stone imperative for any given society to agree on, say, the definitions of words because that's how we communicate. Definitions aren't objective. There's just a tangible benefit to being able to share thoughts and feelings simply by vibrating our throat flaps at each other. See, watch, I'll do it now. <coughs> the fact of the matter is that socially constructed facts aren't self-justifying. For me to accept the necessity for creating a shared objective artistic standard, I need to be shown the societal benefit of such a standard. Which leads us right into... Part 4. Why Objectivity? I've been dancing around this particular issue for most of the video. Like, even assuming that I've been making good arguments so far, I could be missing something. The easiest way to convince me to try finding that thing with you is to show me what we'd get if I were swayed to your side. There's a handful of explanations I've heard as to the societal benefit of a shared objective standard for artistic quality. I'll go through them from worst to best. First, and worst, is the idea that foregoing objectivity will remove the incentive that critics have to represent their targets accurately. This is the worst because I've already shown that the amount of bias has no correlation with how well represented the work is. Any critique that gives a value judgment must contain bias no matter how well founded it is. There are, indeed, porgs in The Last Jedi. Next up is the argument that without objective standards, artists will have free reign to make whatever bullshit they like, and we will be inundated with endless bananas taped to endless walls, all surrounded by what amounts to artistic snake oil salesman routines. 
criticism will die, as without objective standards, there is no way to determine quality or inferiority. My problem with this is twofold. For one, bitch, that's a good thing. I'm sorry, I just personally disagree with the idea that bad art is in and of itself harmful. It's almost like I made a whole video about this exact topic or something. I concede that art can be harmful. I'd argue Nazi propaganda is harmful, but I don't think I would call a piece of art that I considered harmful to be bad in an artistic sense. It's a supplementary discussion. Take a deep look at yourself and answer this question. What is the worst that a piece of simply poorly made art can do to you? I guess it can make you feel bad, bored, annoyed, disgusted, whatever. Uh, I don't think things that make you feel bad are an objective ill, is what I'm saying. But let's just assume that I'm not a pretentious dickweed for two seconds and hop on board the idea that a world with more good art is a better one to live in. All right. I'm a big fan of good art, allegedly. Just one question. Uh... Who the fuck do you think you are? To rephrase, what puts your criticism, or anyone's criticism really, above the works of art they are directed towards? Criticism is a form of art, after all. I fundamentally believe that a worldview that involves critics and artists being in a strictly one-way relationship, artists doing the art and critics keeping them in check, is tragically limited. Critics tell us a lot more than how good a thing is. Interpretations, analysis, cultural context. There's so much more to art criticism that doesn't really get any better when we decide that a certain set of things is objectively good. And as you hurtle towards the conclusion after a two to five hour long rant, you know little more about the film than what happens in it with a few errors and whether some guy on the internet personally enjoyed it. How, what, what else is there that wouldn't come under those two things? Oh yeah, I forgot I'm dealing with a group of people who think that's exactly what critics do. Uh, sorry. Okay, last one and what I consider to be the best argument. If there is no such thing as objective quality, if all art is of equal value, then what is the course of action for a self-motivated artist to improve themselves? Why study anything? Why spend hundreds on classes when absolutely all artistic expression is equivalent? For God's sake, Patty, you're a musician. Actually, glad you mentioned that. It's a good place to start. I am a musician, and I like to think that I've been developing my craft over the years I've been releasing albums. I have an internal drive to learn more about music, about production, about theory. Now, to the objectivity crew, I've just made a massive contradiction, but I disagree. Let me tell you about music theory. Music theory is a fiercely intricate study that most people spend their entire lives trying to understand. but. No matter how deep you go in, you're never going to find out what the best music is. I think this misconception stems from music theory classes in college, which from what I've heard are really just learn to write like Bach classes. And then this leads people to believe that one can use music theory to choose the notes that are more correct in any given situation. Needless to say, music theory is more multifaceted than that. There are potentially as many schools of music theory as there are forms of music. Maybe your professor told you that instruments moving in parallel fifths is the bane of good voice leading. But just wait a couple centuries and it turns out the proper theoretical term is a power chord. See, when you learn music theory, you don't really learn how to write better music. Rather, new modes of expression are bought when you learn the language of the land. And that's not a contradiction either. You don't need to attach objective quality to things to recognize that certain things require knowledge to emulate. There's no value judgment in observation. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but the rest of art academia is like this too. That's what it really means to improve as an artist. When you get to the bottom of it, it's just gaining the knowledge necessary to unlock the modes of expression that suit you. Cause sailing is only fun if you don't know what's kosher. I got some bad news, Spartacus died long ago, sir.
If you thought I couldn't take your shit on the daily, I'll take a wife and didn't take a trip into Australia. Don't you worry about the cam on hand, just gonna take a pic of this blood on my ass, bitch. And if you gave me that chance, you know I'd take my life in 71 fragments. I'm a land surveyor, I'll fuck the mayor. Got a remote control for this sandwich paper, cuz I've been told Schubert ain't a walk in the park. They put poison in the river, I lit fires in the dark. I was a dog in a past life, I tripped a horse, I broke his neck. But I know real ones will love me up until my happy end. Cuz sailing is only fun if you don't know what's kosher. I got some bad news, Spartacus died long ago, sir. Part 5. Newton's Third Law of Motion To close this video out, I'd like to propose something. A fundamental law of art that I believe is the binding force of human artistic expression. It is as follows. The act of establishing a rule or convention in regards to art or artistic practice will necessarily result in the implicit formulation of an equal and opposite anti-convention. What do I mean by this? Well, in art, a rule is really just a commonly enough understood aesthetic result of a certain artistic action. For example, matching elements on screen between the cut when editing a film eases the audience's ability to keep track of the events. This is just something we've been able to learn by experimenting a lot. But the catch is that when we learn a rule in art, we must also implicitly learn what happens when you break that rule. Like, it's just implied. If match cuts help cohesion, foregoing match cuts will lead to disorientation and fatigue. That's just logic. But here's the really sticky part. There is no objective standard that can tell us which road to take. Cohesion or disorientation. Instead of a new rule to live by, we've been given a crossroads. You might think, surely disorienting your audience is a bad idea, but how can you know for certain? After all, we've just indirectly learned the perfect method for doing so. Who's to say it can't be used to effect? Let's find out. Do I stay in key, or do I modulate? Do I paint the subject accurately, or do I embellish? Do I give the audience what they expect, or not? Well, flip a coin. <laughs>